Kid Eaters vs. Zoo Boys, Chapter 10, MRE for Thee. The team swept the sand pit with a fine tooth comb and collected the total of 32 eggs. Dave kept guard the whole time. He saw a few creatures lurking about, but nothing that seemed to offer a threat. The major stood up fully brushed at her uniform, although she got nothing on it the whole time. She patted Dave's shoulder. Her simple quick touch caused him to feel a slight rush of blood to his brain. She called to the others, Okay, men, let's move on. Dave, you hand me items in the order I tell you. We'll get all packed up, okay? Come on over, guys. Gently place the bags with the eggs in this larger bin. She shook what looked like a frisbee. It immediately unfolded like an accordion, becoming a deep five-gallon bucket. She continued, We'll all have to keep a lookout while we finish up here because Dave will be concentrating on helping me load up. He stood guard long enough. It's everybody else's shift now. Ronnie asked, what if the eggs hatch while in the bag or that larger bucket? Major was too busy, so John answered what he thought was best. Taking them out of hibernation or uh, incubation state will slow down their ability to hatch. Ron liked that answer. The cold hard truth that Dave feared was that taking the eggs out from the warm sand would, <coughs> excuse me, not just slow down the baby's birth, the baby bird's development during the birth process, it would terminate their ability to live at all. Jeremy didn't think much about it. The acronym H-A-L-T went through his head, standing for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. He kept his mouth shut, but he wanted to say, let's have omelets. Jeremy was too young or simply didn't pay attention enough in biology to fully understand the eggs that, were, that are edible were unfertilized eggs, not ones that had baby chicks inside waiting to hatch. As they worked, Ron asked, why do they call them zombie chicks? Once again, John answered, well, when they hatch, they come out from under the sand like Zombies rising up out of the ground that it was buried in. Major was giving Dave orders as to which item to hand her next so she could uh, repack efficiently. She broke away momentarily to remind the others, Keep your voices down and your eyes peeled. We don't know. Uh, we don't want to come under attack without knowing about it. The boys were well aware of what that was like. Any early distant warning signs of a threatening attack would enable them to respond appropriately. Ronnie recalled the cat with the head of a fish and seeing a fish that meowed with the head of a cat. They knew very little on what to expect based on rumors alone describing creatures John Hansen developed. But had seen enough up close and personal to know that being on this island was a dangerous game. There were creatures they couldn't have even dreamed of in their worst nightmares. Now they felt a little more prepared to deal with the birds that hunted those fish and cats that hunted, well, that hunted both the birds and the fish. The cats could spring into the air and grab birds out of midair. But the cat's mouths were no larger than that of a bass, so holding on was another story. As she packed up, the major promised the kids that they would eat soon. She pulled together the food supply that, uh, that she brought with her. Ronnie asked, Do we need to, like, catch some fish? We had chicken eggs last time we were here. We built a fire and Dave had like camping gear, like silverware and stuff. Major Hightower was too focused to reply. She put a lid on top of the bucket. 
it had small holes in the top uh, of it for ventilation for the eggs. We'll leave these here for now, she said, then slung her rifle over her shoulder, had Dave put her backpack on again, while she carried the heli lizard and the food rations, MRE, meals ready to eat. It was the same emergency food supply given to the U.S. military personnel, standard survival food. The boys knew where fruit trees were, but Hightower would not let them wander off. She led them just a little further into the aviary until they reached a large pond. Ron wondered if she packed fishing poles or a fishing net. John remembered the alligator in the lake below the island's rope course. He figured those gators were too big for this pond, not to mention he was sure any gator in that area would have eaten everything uh, everything within its jaws. The cat with the fish mouths may not grasp the larger birds, but those gators could, and gators could leap up with the strength of their tail, far higher than the cat would ever or could ever jump. Without a word exchange, the boys began to think about the gators too. Their thoughts almost ran away with them, so they kept trying to convince themselves that it was safe here, especially with this commando commander by their side. They kept their eyes shifting between the water and the woman leading them. Major Hightower took for granted how to prep the food in the in kits like this one she opened. It never occurred to her that these kids had never seen anything like this. The boy's eyes and attention sprung toward the silver bag she held in her hands. She twisted it, and it made a pop sound, then a hiss. Had the boys not been watching, they would have assumed it was some type of predator. John reacted, Oh, like Jiffy Pop. The major responded, What? Oh, the popcorn in the tin and the tinfoil top that puffed up when heated? Well... Kinda, but not really. When you twist this bag, it creates a chemical reaction and heats up from the inside out. I don't fully know how it works. I'm not really the science type geeks who introduced this technology, but it tastes pretty good and it's easy, even without a fire. While eating the stew cooked by the chemical reaction, the boys longed for the safety of the empty cage located here in the aviary somewhere. What Jeremy saw next almost made him choke, and he could do all he could do was point at the pond. Dave caught literally the tail end of what startled his friend. He shouted, "Flying fish!" Major hushed him. Don't shout. Just then, they all saw another one. It leaped up, breaking the surface of the water and gliding through the air just above the water. All of them, even the major, shouted, Whoa! Dave asked Hightower, Is that a fish or a bird? I thought this building was mainly for, like, birds. Ron jumped into the conversation. Looks like a bird until it goes back into the water and stays there. Maybe he's like fish, uh, chasing fish under the water. Dave felt that Ronnie's response was a direct attack toward him. You know what I mean, Ronnie. Ronnie was confused. He was just, he wasn't arguing. He was just expressing himself, commenting on what he just witnessed. Just then, before a full-blown argument ignited, they gained a better visual advantage of the mystical alien. This time... Rather than just soaring across the surface, it rose up high from the water. It quickly took full flight, completely leaving the water below. The UFO did a 180-degree turn and headed straight back down into the water, hardly even making a splash as it made contact with the H2O. It was in their sight long enough for them to take note. It was actually a cute and adorable creature. Jeremy said softly, Don't frighten it. It's kind of like a butterfly, but it flies a lot better. 
John chimed in with a whisper, like uh, uh, a fairy, a pixie. Dave's words slid out. Peter Pan's Tinkerbell? He hoped they didn't hear him. Another flew up and out, then down again. Hightower silently observed it. She quickly pulled out the list of a man and a manual. She scanned it for an illustration that matched the species of fish, bird, or fairy. Jeremy asked, Is it a type of frog or a... Uh, I mean, like an am amphibian? Even Dave knew an amphibious animal could breathe in air and or water. Dave added, yeah, like a teenage mutant ninja turtle. That almost started a whole nother heated argument regarding the difference between reptiles and amphibious animals. The others knew turtles didn't breathe in water. They held their breaths, just like gators do. Dave didn't mean that it was a turtle, just a mutant. The leader was frantically flipping pages while, she, while what was in her mind came out of her mouth. Mutant for sure. Somehow that solved the disagreement before it escalated any further. Mutations, that is exactly what they were dealing with on this island. No telling what type of interspe interspersed species they were discovering living things no one had ever seen. No scientists would be able to lump in what was found by just a few people with what they already knew existed. The science books could all be thrown out and burned when trying to categorize what, categorize what they came across in this zoo. As quickly as it rose, it dove once again head first into the water. Jeremy's imagination jumped to birds like pelicans that soared real high, then dive-bombed into the ocean to capture their food. John pictured how he would draw this type of bird, fish, fairy. Dave thought about penguins, the only bird he knew that was better at swimming than flying. He was pretty sure they weren't even able to fly at all. The only thing on Ronnie's mind were boobies. He remembered reading about how a bird, referred to as a booby, would float on the top of the water, then dive under to fish for its dinner. Booby wasn't its official name, but much easier to remember and say. Kind of funny, too. As their eyes scanned the water for another one to pop up, one just like it sprang from the edge closest to them, and without any notice, it landed on Ronnie's face and stayed there. Its wet and slimy wings wrapped around his head, almost touching each other on the other side. It seemed to actually target him. Dave literally laughed out loud. Its fairy tale looking face spun around and made eye contact with the others. Jeremy jeered. Ronnie couldn't scream, but his body language shouted. John called, Major, it's taking over Ronnie's whole face. Her head snapped up from the book it was buried in. She pulled a jar from one of the many pockets built into her pants. She exclaimed, Peel it off! Put it in this jar! Although she gave that directive, she did it herself in one smooth move, as if she had been rehearsing it a thousand times. Ronnie was relieved, but still shocked. He flinched as he noticed another... Uh, as he noticed some other kind of monster sprout up from within the reeds at the edge of the pond. This one resembled a tadpole, but with a mouth. Whatever it was, it spit in David's face. David went from a gut-wrenching laughter to a strong objection. Aw, oh, man, are you serious right now? Some of the saliva went into his mouth and mixed with his. With that, he couldn't speak any further. Major Hightower threw him a towel as she spoke. That's what they call a poly polywog, or spitting pole. I saw that in the field journal. It's harmless, really, but 
You may not be able to speak until its venom is flushed out of your system completely. That spit is their only defense. The other boys were glad to hear that David was going to be okay, but also glad if he wouldn't be able to speak for a while. Not that that would keep him from arguing or fighting with them. Ronnie asked for a towel, too. Dave threw the one he used at Ronnie. Ronnie didn't want to even touch that one. Hightower threw Ron a new towel. She asked Ronnie, Does it burn? He answered, No, it's kind of cool. I don't mean cool as in cool, but like cool the temperature. She nodded. I know what you mean. Let me know if it feels how it feels in a little bit. Dave motioned as if saying, huh? What about me? She knew what Dave meant, too, and said gently, you'll be fine. Don't be a pup. All the other boys smirked. They thought it was great that she picked up their slang and used it against the bully and Dave. He couldn't come back with anything verbally, but sure used the rest of his body to flick her off. She rebuked him. Watch it, mister. Ronnie spoke up again. It is turning ice cold. Is that okay? Am I going to be okay? He wanted to be babied. The major assured him. Yes, yes, the effects won't last forever, he whimpered. But for how long? She felt that she had coddled him enough, and her voice rang with the tone of his dad. Don't you start crying, too. Her smile relieved him because she knew that, or he knew that she said, I'm sorry. Her smile relieved him because he knew what she said was another slight toward Dave being a baby, or pup, not the big dog he thought he was. Dave walked over to Ronnie, who thought he was about to be slugged. Dave was just retrieving the tally through. All but Dave noticed the slime on his face was rapidly changing colors. At first it was clear. Now they saw it change to black, then dark purple, royal blue, light blue, and finally an aqua green. Hightower threw a little bottle toward him. It had some type of white fluid in it. Dave used his shoulders and arms to ask what it was. She said, it's milk. Milk can neutralize chemicals like pepper spray. It should help with any irritation that venom may cause. Pour it. Her instructions weren't fully completed as she watched Dave drink it rather than pour it over his face. She finished with, or, uh, drink it. That may work too. You'll be fine, unless you're part snake. It's poison to snakes and some lizards. She paused for effect, then said, seriously, you'll both be fine. As those words finished coming out of her mouth, there was a big rustle coming from the bushes behind her. She whipped out her sidearm and spun around ready to shoot. As the animal parted the small bushes, they saw just its head. I'm going to stop there and go to part B.